Greetings, Eric Becker, naturopath from New Zealand, author of Candida Crusher. Thank you for tuning in to this video today. <clears throat> this video is going to be a comprehensive video about irritable bowel syndrome. Irritable bowel syndrome is a condition that I've seen now for almost 30 years in the clinic, a long, long time. It's quite a common complaint that affects probably between 10 to 15 percent of the population in the Western world at any given time. It's not uncommon to get patients in with functional bowel disturbances. In fact, they probably make up about 10% of what a medical practitioner would see uh, in his or her clinic at any given time and probably count for about 50% of all the cases that a gastroenterologist or a bowel specialist would see. <coughs> Excuse me. So let's just first look at the signs and symptoms uh, that encompass uh, irritable bowel syndrome. The typical signs and symptoms that we would see would be bloating, would be gas, there could be all sorts of uncomfortable sensations in the gut, there could be spasms or cramping sensations, uh, could, um, as I said bloating and gas are common, constipation and diarrhea, particularly alternating constipation and diarrhea uh, are common with irritable bowel syndrome. What's not common however is to see a patient who's bleeding from the bowel <clears throat> or would have anemia you no know, low iron counts, uh, or would have fevers, sweats at night, uh, those sorts of things that uh, don't tend to really to be irritable bowel syndrome. I would refer you to a gastroenterologist for uh, scoping because you may have inflammatory bowel syndrome, which is a separate complaint. That's an autoimmune disease. <clears throat> it's less common than irritable bowel syndrome, but we still see it in the clinic quite regularly from time to time, particularly ulcerative colitis which will be the, the feature of another entire video that I'll do at some stage. So IBS, it's interesting when I went to America in 2003 for some training a long time ago, I heard Dr. Alan Gaby speaking. Dr. Alan Gaby is the past um, president of the American Holistic Association and Dr. Gaby calls IBS a garbage can diagnosis. So he believes that's a condition Garbage can diagnosis is a condition he, um, he believes is uh, the ones where the doctors throw people in a rubbish tin and hope that someone else will take it away because they're in the too hard basket. Functional complaints like adrenal fatigue, candida diagnosis, irritable bowel syndrome, these are what Dr. Gaby calls a garbage can diagnosis. And I would tend to agree because it's very easy to see a patient in a five minute time slot and then say to the patient, well, we'll run all the tests but if we can't find anything, you know, we might give you an antidepressant or if it's irritable bowel syndrome, which I see a lot, we'll just put you on a fiber supplement. So that's a bit of a cop-out because Western medical doctors don't tend to really be interested in looking at causes of conditions. They would rather treat the symptoms that are presenting. So, which is really unfortunate for the patient because if a patient has had a functional bowel complaint for many years, that can lead to anxiety and depression. And not only that, if a functional bowel complaint goes on for a long, long period of time, that can even lead to diseases in its own right, many types of conditions. So let's now explore the four uh, main causes that I would tend to see a lot with irritable bowel syndrome. <clears throat> so I'm just going to grab my note sheet here. So the common ones I would see with patients would be allergies. Allergies is quite common. We'll go into that in a minute. Uh, bugs all kinds of bugs patients can present with, uh, which can often cause IBS. We're looking at candida, or parasites, you know, uh, small intestinal bowel overgrowth. Uh, stress is a really big one. Uh, stress is often not spoken about with the bowel. And intolerances. So let's clearly understand that food intolerances and food allergies are two entirely different things. People often get them confused. Allergies are associated with the immune system. And the common allergies I would see with IBS would be dairy allergy, probably number one. Dr. Hyman on YouTube and many other doctors believe that gluten is a big one, but I don't believe that at all. I believe gluten problems become a real issue with people who've had a gut issue for a considerable period of time. <clears throat> people who've had poor bacterial levels, poor digestive enzyme levels for some period of time, many times they end up being coming intolerant to gluten because of that. It's not the gluten that causes the problem, it's they had a problem and gluten made it worse. So the common allergies you'll find uh, in 
my candida crushing book, I wrote quite a lot about food allergies, but the typical allergies we would see would be dairy allergies, number one. I see a lot of banana allergies, pineapple allergies, peanut, chocolate, sugar allergies, and of course gluten's on that list as well. Uh, egg is another allergy that we commonly see. So I would say to you, if you've got IBS, if you want to shake it really quick, have a look if you are eating any of those foods I mentioned and certainly pull them all out of the diet before you go running off to the doctor. So take those foods out of your diet if you, if you suspect an allergy and you have IBS. Intolerances are different altogether. Intolerances are developed usually because of enzyme problems that the person will have, lack of di sufficient digestive enzymes or one specific enzyme that will break one particular food component down like a starch or a sugar. For example, lactose intolerance. The person has an issue with lactase with the enzyme to break lactose down, so that will cause bloating and diarrhea. So lactose intolerance is not an allergy as such. <clears throat> so don't get them confused. Tests can be done um, you know, to work out if you have any of these allergies or intolerances. There's a very good food allergy test you can do through a company called US Biotech in uh, Seattle. They do a very good food allergy panel, a blood-based panel, to determine if you have an allergy against uh, up to 100 different common foods and beverages. You can even do a spice panel and an inhalant panel to see if you've got allergies for spices or anything that you might breathe in. So those things are worth scoping out if you have IBS. Intolerances as well. If you believe you have intolerances, cut milk out because it's the most common intolerance is dairy intolerance. So it doesn't matter whether you have organic milk or you know milk that's unpasteurized or uh, unhomogenized but straight from the cow, you can still have a problem with this food product. So I'd recommend that you get rid of all dairy if you've got IBS. That's the first thing that you do. So if we look at the second category, that would be bugs. Bugs are quite common with many people. Many people uh, take pharmaceutical medications like you know, antibiotics, the pill, hormone replacement therapy. Uh, there are many pharmaceutical medications that will disorder or disrupt the bowel. And once we start getting some uh, changes in bowel flora, we're leaving the bowel much more prone to, to developing a candida albicans overgrowth, which is very common with irritable bowel syndrome. I see lots of patients with candida who have IBS. But similarly, I also see lots of patients with parasitic infections like Blastocystis hominis, Diamantiba fragilis. Uh, you know, these are weird names, but these are bugs that we commonly see in people with IBS. So people end up with one pathogen, they could end up with multiple pathogens. You know, it's a bit like weeds in a garden. You end up with one weed and you know, within a year or two, the whole garden is completely overgrown and unmanageable. So sometimes you'll go to the doctor and then the weed spray will be brought in, you know, i.e. antibiotics or, or potent antifungals. They'll kill everything off and you're left with a decimated lawn. It's a bit like what Monsanto does with the glyphosate or Roundup. We'll just come in and round up the whole lot, kill it all off. What a load of crap. It's not really the way to go. I really don't believe that drugs like fluconazole, uh, you know, these, these pharmaceutically prescribed antifungals or antibiotics are the way to go. There are many natural alternatives. I developed a product up called Canzida for that reason. It contains 11 ingredients and it's probably the best antifungal, antibacterial that you're going to get on the market today. So Canzida.com. And I guarantee you this product, if you take it as directed, will not aggravate you or make you feel sick or wipe out a lot of your beneficial bacteria. <clears throat> so with the bugs... It's a matter of getting the balance back again. So don't eat foods and take drinks that feed these bugs. All right? Uh, you know, you can read a lot about these on yeastinfection.org. So foods containing sugar, confectionery, candy, ice cream, alcohol, soda drinks, all these sorts of foods, white bread, too much bread in your diet, cookies, cakes, all these sorts of foods, they feed up uh, the bad bugs. So having a diet which is, tends to be a lot richer in the lean proteins and the leafy greens and grains which I believe are good are brown rice and quinoa, a very good grain to eat. So these things don't play into the hands of the bad bugs. So getting your bugs back in balance is important. Understanding intolerances, food intolerances, food allergies is important. Um, if we move on, <clears throat> stress is probably never really spoken of. I watched Dr. Hyman's clip on irritable bowel and, and Dr. Hyman never really mentioned stress or its implication with irritable bowel. I can tell you now, in my professional opinion, 
Stress accounts for 40% of irritable bowel syndrome. That's almost half. So think about this for a minute. 10% of people who go to doctors have IBS, and about almost half of those people go to the doctor with gut-related problems that are stress-induced. Stress is one of the biggest causes, silent causes, um, of most disease today. And it's very loose-term stress. Many patients, when I talk to about stress, they don't even believe they've got stress or can't see how the stress is implicated in their condition. I saw several patients yesterday, and in fact, I saw eight patients, and three out of those eight had a gut problem a serious gut problem and when I analyzed each one of those cases I could see how stress affected all of those patients uh, in particular the ones with the gut problem. Stress has the most amazing way of destroying a person's digestive system and it will do so on several different levels. But one of the, the most common occurrences of stress is how it affects the gut. It's going to really affect it because blood's going to be taken away from the digestive system to the larger muscles particularly in the alarm phase or the initial phases of stress. So the, the body has three stages of stress, but the alarm phase was designed to get us away from any kind of threat. <clears throat> now, what about if my mobile phone rings or you know, telephone rings or, or a demand is placed on me? Well, this is basically an alarm. So you may not think that is a stress, but repeated alarms continually punctuated by big emotional stresses that we have, uh, things that affect our gut profoundly. If you look at your lifestyle and the kind of stresses you live under and you start analysing your digestive malfunctions, you'll see that there's you know, quite a strong correlation there. Lots of people eat in front of computers. And in fact, I checked with each patient I had yesterday uh, about his or her uh, you know, handling of their mobile phone use. And most people admit that they spend far too much time checking emails or messaging or, or calling on their cell phone, even during meals. It's ridiculous. These are the things that cause functional gut problems. So you clearly have to understand that your lifestyle affects your digestive function to a marked degree. If you want to kick that irritable bowel syndrome in days, you need to have some clear boundaries and go on what, what we call a digital detox and start realizing the connection. Uh, as the years roll by, I tend to see more and more people with stress-related digestive malfunction and typically uh, irritable bowel syndrome. And once I teach the patient, you know, these concepts and we start teaching relaxation more, interesting, we find how the digestive system improves, even without diet change or supplement change or anything at all, just by teaching the patient how to relax a lot more. Okay, so stress affects the gut on quite a deep level. So those are the key things that, uh, that I believe are the causes of irritable bowel syndrome, allergies, intolerances, bugs, uh, and stress. So there are many different things you can do to get on top of irritable bowel syndrome. A key thing you could do if you've had IBS for many years is to do a comprehensive stool test to find out A, what kind of bugs you've got, you know, uh, B, what the imbalances are like uh, of these particular bugs. Have you got you know, any good bugs? You may have um, hardly any beneficial bacteria at all <clears throat> and only a moderate amount of bad bacteria. Uh, and quite a lot of candida, for example. Well, we'll only know that through a stool culture. Uh, C, have you got any inflammation going on in the bowel? So this could be a prelude down the track towards uh, inflammatory bowel conditions. Sometimes IBS can turn into IBD. Irritable bowel syndrome can become inflammatory bowel syndrome. So doing a, a functional stool test will give me an idea on your immune markers or inflammation markers, the bacteria markers. We also look at things called short-chain fatty acids, which are, which are the products of bacterial fermentation. Uh, there are many different things we can find. Occult blood, we can see if there's any, any blood in the stool at all. So very, very worthwhile test. I tend to do a lot of stool testing, and I work through Doctors Data in Chicago, who I believe have got the world's best stool lab. So after performing um, a few thousand of these tests, I've come to the conclusion um, that many people have got poor levels of beneficial bacteria, uh, too many um, different kinds of bad bacteria, and also poor immune function. We can see that through a level, a marker called secretory IgA. So what are the solutions for people with IBS? How do we get on top of the condition? Well, if you're intelligent, you'll try and work out what the, what the primary causes are. What started 
you on this pathway to getting IBS. Okay, I'll call that the exciting or the primary cause. And then B, the maintaining cause, what's keeping it going? Okay, those two things need to be addressed. Often if you deal with the causes, particularly the maintaining cause, uh, you'll find that you'll get significant relief in a short period of time. <clears throat> Either doing a food allergy profile or a stool test will give you a pretty good idea on what to target. Making a diet change is a very smart thing with, with IBS. You need to make dietary changes. If you go to yeastinfection.org, you can read a lot more about my diet advice for candida patients, which certainly doesn't contra uh, contradict the information I give for IBS as well. I tend to people on, put people on a low allergy diet is a key thing. So elimination diet. And as they improve, I start you know, doing a reintroduction. So I also recommend that you take some good quality probiotics. They're very important to take probiotics to reseed the gut. And then we recommend products you know, like vitamin A, evening primrose oil, fish oils, uh, glutamine. There are many different nutrients I recommend at the tail end of treatment to repair uh, the digestive system. Most patients with IBS, in my opinion, have got stress-induced problems, candida-related problems, and leaky gut syndrome. So I've written a whole big post on leaky gut syndrome. It's when the gut becomes more permeable and proteins can start getting in through the digestive system and affect the immune system on the other side. And that can cause a lot of problems, a lot of low-grade inflammation and problems in the body. You can get brain fog out of it and sore joints and fatigue and many different things can occur as a result of leaky gut. So that gives you a little bit of information on irritable bowel syndrome. This is a condition that can be fixed up literally within a week. It's possible. It's possible to fully cure IBS literally within two to three weeks. But within days, you can get significant relief from this condition. Now, don't let anyone tell you that it's incurable or you know, there's no cause uh, and that you'll need to stay on antidepressants or sleeping pills or Metamucil like fiber supplements for life. It's a lot of nonsense. You don't need to do that. So any doctor who tells you to go on fiber because you've got IBS, uh, in my opinion, is giving you wrong advice. Okay, You need to address the cause. That's intelligence. All right? Just remember, common sense isn't very common in medicine. All right? You need to take responsibility in your own hands when it comes to uh, healing yourself from this condition because most all cases of IBS is diet and lifestyle related. All of Just about all cases have some component of stress. Don't forget that. So if you're living in a stressful situation, you got, you know, uh, you're stressed in your relationship, either professionally or socially, with your children or your employer, employees, whatever, this is what needs fixing up. You need to get to the, to the root cause. If you can get this sorted, along with your diet, maybe a few you know, carefully placed supplements, you can get on top of this problem. You don't need to have constant diarrhea and constipation and, and gurgling sounds and bloating. and you, know, you don't need to have any of those complaints. They can all be remedied, but you have to take matters into your own hands. So I hope this YouTube clip has given you some good information today on irritable bowel syndrome. And the last words I'll leave you with is, um, it is curable, but it's all up to you. Thanks for tuning in.